Believe it or not, there was a time when Ubisoft was one of the most innovative gaming companies out there. The golden age of Ubisoft, early to mid-2000s according to my personal criteria that I just made up, saw the release of many games that are now considered classics in their own right. Games like Prince of Persia, Rayman, Rainbow Six Vegas, Beyond Good and Evil are some examples. There was of course the odd one out, like 13, but as I said in my review, or that I, it's been a while. What a game lacks in mechanical complexity, it makes up for in the sheer creativity and weirdness of its presentation and premise. Then there's Splinter Cell. Like any early 2000s kid without a good computer and stable internet connection, my only contact with the latest releases was through low resolution screenshots in gaming magazines. Yes, I am old enough to have experienced print gaming journalism at its absolute peak. And let me tell you, back in the early 2000s, you couldn't turn a page without stumbling into a piece advertising Splinter Cell's lighting effects, shadow system, cool spy gadgets, and of course Sam Fisher's iconic split jump. Splinter Cell was one of the last true gaming magazine games. Those games that just looked naturally good on the glossy pages of print media. Playing it now, 20 years later, I can kinda see where the hype was coming from. Splinter Cell didn't break new ground with its gameplay. Thief beat them to the punch with light and shadow based stealth by about 4 years. The story harkened back to Metal Gear Solid, but without the cheese and camp that series is known for. But Splinter Cell studied those games dutifully and looked for ways to improve what they did and bring something new to the table. Did they succeed? Well, that's what we're gonna try to find out today. So with all that in mind, let's take a relatively brief look at what makes Splinter Cell click. Before we start, I have a Twitter where tweets get tweeted at a relatively steady pace, and a Patreon where you can support the channel with real life money. Also let me know in the comments if you'd like to see me cover the sequels. Let's go. That's ridiculous. Splinter Cell is set in the high-tech, far-future timeline of 2004. You play as Sam Fisher, a gruff middle-aged ex-Navy SEAL officer who joins the 3rd Echelon, a newly formed division of the NSA headed by his buddy Irving Lambert. The game kicks off with a short, atmospheric cutscene where the two friends exchange some banter and Sam is filled on on what the 3rd Echelon is all about. Sam Fisher, the office rat that he'd become, is then promptly sent to the training grounds to get readjusted to field work. This is just an in-game excuse for the tutorial. Remember this section, I'll use it as a point of reference in the gameplay segment for reasons I'll explain at the appropriate time. Anyways, two months later, Fisher is sent to Georgia, no, not the American Georgia, the country Georgia, to investigate the disappearance of two CIA agents. The two CIA agents are Alice Madison, an operative who had been installed in the new government of President Kombai Nikolaje an influential industrialist who seized power in a bloodless coup d'etat following the assassination of his predecessor in a suicide bomb attack allegedly committed by Abkhazian separatists, and Robert Blaustein, who was sent there to find her. I know, I know, it's a lot to take in, but just bear with me. In Georgia, Sam discovers that the two CIA agents were killed on Nikolaj's orders. Unfortunately for the two CIA agents, they were the ones who uncovered that Nikolaj had been waging an ethnic cleansing campaign across Azerbaijan with Georgian commandos. NATO then retaliates by sending ground troops to Azerbaijan, prompting the Georgian president to go into hiding. With Nikolaj fully exposed for the maniacal and psychopathic dictator that he actually is, he waged is an information war against the United States, leaving the Western intelligence community with no other choice but to cloak and dagger the world out of a potential third world war. I wouldn't say Splinter Cell's story will turn any heads, but it's entertaining enough if you're a sucker for espionage shit like I am. You got a maniacal baddie with a ridiculous accent, a stoic operative that executes sensitive, potentially world altering covert assignments with cold efficiency, Russian mobsters, Byzantine ever shifting webs of alliances and rivalries between governments, intelligence agencies and criminal figures, and so on. It's not a hard story to follow. Not that convolutedness is necessarily a mark of quality, of course. But like any Tom Clancy story, or rather Tom Clancy inspired story, its strengths lie not in the complexity of the plot, but the details. You'd be forgiven for thinking that Tom Clancy's technically detailed prose is not a good fit for video games. 
I'm talking about his knack for presenting logistics and detailing the culture of the intelligence agencies executing covert operations. But Splinter Cell managed to capture and convey the spirit of his stories. For instance, there's how Nicolaji used his wealth and political influence to seize power and transform Georgia into a hub of technological innovation. He then lobbied NATO leaders for stronger ties with the US and bid his time for the perfect opportunity to strike against them. Meanwhile, he hired Western scientists to build algorithms to hide what he was doing in Azerbaijan. By John. The reading material from the game actually explains all this, it's really interesting. I wouldn't say Nicolaje is a particularly nuanced villain, but the existence of these morsels of world building covering his rise to power, his engineering of a full blown technological revolution in Georgia, and his conning of NATO to believe he is an honest man elevate Nicolaje at least like maybe two levels above your mustache twirling villain. And this also harkens back to what I said earlier about Clancy's dense, technical, detail oriented prose. Splinter Cell makes sure to explain the how, the why, and the yes, but how exactly of its world. It also helps that there's no disconnect between the presentation and the grounded in reality vibe the game is going for. I'm not referring to graphical fidelity, of course. Quick aside, so back in my hometown I have this huge stack of hardware and gadget magazines from the early to mid 2000s. Whenever I'm in the mood for some analog media, I grab one of those magazines and spend a couple of hours flipping through it. And every time I do this, I have such a blast reading those glowing reviews praising a cell phone's one megabyte of storage or MMS features or whatever. But my favorite, let's call it genre of tech article, is the prediction piece. So back then the trend was to make everything, be it cell phones or MP the MP3 players <laughs> and shit ridiculously small. MP3, MP3. MP3, what a stupid fucking word. Anyways, small or slim meant the absolute peak of technology. Remember the Motorola V3 ads? And I stumbled into this piece which predicted that in the 2010s, cell phones will be so small that you'd barely register them when holding them in your hand. The article went into great detail about the feasibility of this design, the technology required to make this possible, and yeah, that article was a true knee slapper. Especially since nowadays the many computers we carry with us at all times are so voluminous that they leave imprints on our front pockets. So what does this have to do with our game? Well, Splinter Cell is an espionage thriller about a rogue country waging an informational war on the world. So technology plays an important role in its story. The more reliant a story is on current day technology, the more it runs the risk of it feeling dated. And weirdly, I didn't feel that with Splinter Cell. I believe this is thanks to the restraint Ubisoft showed in this respect, as they focused more on utility when designing the technology. Everything looks and feels grounded in reality, but not this or that reality, rather an universal reality. For that reason, you'll see a mix of analog and high-tech gadgets. Likewise, Sam's stealth suit is also very utilitarian. A matte black skin-tight suit built from sound dampening and light-absorbing materials. Ubisoft have also shown restraint when designing Splinter Cell's environments, which are mostly nondescript industrial slash office spaces. These are not what you would call inspired, but man, they're so atmospheric. Sneaking through an office and hearing the beeps and boops and clanks of computers and keyboards and routers or the hum of an oil rig, it's so fucking cool. It has such a strong sense of place. Naturally, Splinter Cell's presentational elements play an important role in the gameplay. As early as the tutorial, told you I'd return to it, I was struck by how well this game holds up 20 years later. Animations are mostly fluid and responsive, with just enough of a delay to, I assume, convey Sam's age and not disrupt gameplay. Or maybe that wasn't the intention of the devs at all and I'm just reaching like I usually do. According to the wikis, Sam is supposed to be 47 years old a fact which I find really interesting. I couldn't find any sources explaining Sam's age, but if I had to guess, it's supposed to be a reflection of the fact that he's a workaholic who has, like, dedicated his entire life to his country, or that he's simply the best at the kind of work he does. 
He has the age and experience to understand the geopolitical implications and the sensitive nature of his work. After all, you don't want some hot-headed 20-something-year-old agent blasting his way through a North Korean embassy and starting a war. Anyways, back to the game. So Splinter Cell's primary focus, as you can imagine, is stealth with a strong emphasis on light and darkness. Players are encouraged to stay concealed in the shadows whenever possible. The game displays a light meter, this thing right here, that reflects how visible Sam is to enemies. At zero, you're invisible. Two's basically a coin flip. At four, you... Lit up like a Dutch brothel. Who the fuck wrote this? To level the playing field, Sam can destroy light sources and create pockets of darkness. You might think this feature would make the game too easy, but actually it requires careful planning because 1. Not all light sources are destroyable and 2. Enemies tend to notice lights going out and freak the fuck out. Oh and 3. The gunplay is not what I would call ideal or reliable. This is by design as shooting enemies is strongly discouraged. The player begins all missions with a FN57 sidearm and some missions with a FN F2000 assault rifle. Both suppressed. That might sound overkill for a stealth game where lethal force is supposed to be discouraged, but the game addresses this issue proactively with a shrinking reticle aim system in the vein of Deus Ex. It's not as finicky to use, but it makes lining headshots on moving enemies kinda tricky. So with shooting firmly and only as a last resort territory, players are incentivized to think out of the box and overcome challenges through what I like to call spy fuckery. In this game, spy fuckery comes in two broad categories. Gadgets, and athletics, for lack of a better word. Each mission, Sam is equipped with a limited amount of certain gadgets. Some, like lockpicks, are always available, since the level design is sometimes too reliant on them for its own good. Other gadgets are situational, like ring airfoil projectiles, gas grenades and sticky shockers, all of which can be fired from Sam's assault rifle. Honestly, this makes the assault rifle seem more like a gadget dispenser than a lethal weapon. What's cool is that, if you really think about it, the assault rifle Rifle's ridiculous versatility has a practical explanation. As I said, Splinter Cells <laughs> perform the darkest of black ops. Some missions are so politically sensitive that they have to waive their right of existence. Here's Lambert telling Sam exactly that before infiltrating the CIA HQ to gather intel about the potential mole. Yes, the NSA is spying on the CIA. Yes, I'm fully aware of the optics of such an assignment in 2022. So basically, the grab the potentially world disrupting intel and bounce nature of their missions requires them to pack light. My only gripe with the gadgets concerns the mic camera, which is criminally underused. And that's putting it lightly, you use it a few times and in all cases it's tied to a mission critical objective. Imagine using the mic camera to snoop on enemy conversations for door codes and shit, that would be neat. But who needs fancy mic cameras when you can just snatch a guard from the shadows and bully him into revealing a door? code, right? Or how about dragging their sorry asses to the face scanner and slamming their heads against it? In both cases you get the double benefit of feeling like a badass and, hearing Michael Ironsides, the voice of Sam Fisher, deadpan roll. Man, it's like he was born to play this character. Now, the second category of spy fuckery Splinter Cell offers, which I clumsily dubbed athletics, is kind of a mixed bag. Fisher is surprisingly spry for a 47 year old dude and has a variety of maneuvers. He can mantle onto and climb along ledges, hang from pipes, jump off of surfaces to reach high ledges and of course his iconic split jump. Now as I said the animations are fluid and responsive. The platforming is competent so no issues there. But, 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 this, this fucking split jump, I used it only once and in the tutorial of all places. I know exactly one other very specific place where I could have had Sam do it, but I figured simply shooting the lights and eating the guard was simpler. So the split jump serves no practical purpose other than to look good in screenshots. Same thing goes for Sam's Prince of Persia like jumping off of Wall's thingy. I used it exactly once during the tutorial. It's a shame that these mechanics are so underutilized. This next part might sound silly given Splinter Cell's focus on stealth, but I was surprised by the amount of mechanics and artifices inserted to reinforce this theme. Here's one, Sam holding his hand on the holster of his pistol when crouching, or his goggles shining with a bright green light when hidden in the shadows. I know this is gamey as all hell, it's there to make Sam stand out in the dark, but you can't deny it looks freaking cool. Then there's a... Uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, but basically there are four tiers of movement and the faster you walk, the more noise you make. So if you want to keep it on the down low, it's advised you approach guards crouched with the slowest form of movement active. I wish I'd found a simpler way to explain it, but 
Hey man, if you've made it this far in the video, uh, first of all, thank you for watching and your support. Please subscribe, like this video and share it with your friends. And second, now a stealth game is only as good as its AI. I'll be brief here because AI design is way, way, way above my pay grade. It's competent. No nasty surprises. Apart from the odd moment when it was more reactive and sensitive to my actions than it should have been, or an enemy spotting me for no apparent reason, I don't have anything to complain about. Splinter Cell keeps things fresh by mixing and matching mission objectives. As a guy used to the freeform design of immersive sims, the day I will stop talking about this genre will be the day I fucking die. I used to really hate mission restrictions. Okay, I know Thief had them, but just bear with me. But in time, as I started judging games more analytically and started peeking under the hood of game design, so to speak, I've grown to really respect this way of doing things. It also helps that Splinter Cell has some baller mission setups to justify these restrictions. Let me give you a small example. There's one level that has Sam infiltrating the Chinese embassy in Myanmar to confirm ties between Nicolaje and a high-ranking Chinese general. You are not allowed to kill anyone, as doing so would point to the US meddling with another country's affairs and trigger a global war. I know, it's not the greatest of justifications, but it works. I immediately understood why I am not allowed to eat soldiers in a country the US has no business spying on and I went with it. Similarly, you are not allowed to kill CIA agents in Langley because, well, they're your colleagues and, you know, the NSA doesn't officially spy on US citizens, so you're not supposed to even be there in the first place. An important part of my video making process, especially when the topic is a game old enough to drive, is scanning contemporaneous reviews and forum posts for insights. Getting an idea of how a game was perceived at release helps me set my expectations accordingly. But as much as I want to judge a game through the lens of a modern perspective, there's only so much you can demand from a 20 year old game. On the other hand, ultimately what matters is how you experience this ancient product today, as a person with limited time and an ever expanding backlog of games. Not how Matthew from 2002 perceived it through his dingy CRT. Anyways, when researching Splinter Cell, I stumbled into this quote from a review published in The Village Voice around the time of its release. If this game were any more realistic, you'd have to hold in your farts. I was taken aback by how much much I agreed with it, in spirit. Thing is, in 2022, Splinter Cell conveys this feeling of realism not through graphical fidelity, rather its strong sense of place and the butt-clenching tension it creates through its themes. The main appeal of stealth games is their ability to supply the player with that kind of adrenaline rush you only get when you're in a place you're not supposed to be in, doing something that you're damn well not supposed to do. Imagine sneaking into the high school bathroom to have a quick smoke before gym or jumping the fence into an abandoned stadium to crack open some cold ones with the boys. These are two totally hypothetical examples and I don't condone that sort of behavior. Well, Splinter Cell checks all those marks. It's tense, atmospheric. I know there are games that probably do this better, <coughs> Thief, but Splinter Cell captures this in a linear 10 hour long game which is quite an achievement in itself. That said, as much as I gushed for the better part of this video, I can switch off that insufferable part of my brain that adds a little asterisk next to each positive. Let's rip the bandaid off. Splinter Cell is considered the weakest entry of the original trilogy and deservedly so. Most of the time, Splinter Cell feels like a fleshed out feature complete product. But the more you play, the more noticeable the limits of its design become. I wish the underutilized mechanic were its only drawback, but that's sadly not the case. Let's start small. After the tutorial, the game stops tutorializing even when it introduces new gadgets. Look, I am all for not holding the player's hand, but at least give me a heads up that I have new gadgets. I can figure out their purpose by myself, but for that to happen, I have to be aware of their existence. As it stands, I have to manually rummage from my inventory at the start of the mission just to see if the game gave me something new, and then pop open this butt ugly screen for info and hear this horrible fucking sound.
my second gripe is Splinter Cell's nonsensical alarm system. It took me a while to figure out because the game doesn't do a great job of explaining it. Depending on the objectives, missions can have up to 3 alarm limits. Reach the cap and the mission ends. The problem is that the alarm system is tied to the body hiding mechanic. For example, at certain points during a mission, the game scans for bodies that are not hidden and if it finds them, the player gets one alarm. Since levels are devoid of containers matching the exact size of a human being, again like in any stealth game, I assumed that I'd be safe as long as I made sure to stash bodies in areas that I had already cleared of enemies. They're technically hidden since there's no one to find them, right? No. Turns out you have to leave bodies in absolute darkness for the game to consider them hidden, regardless of the area's uh, occupancy rate. So what I ended up doing was wasting precious ammo shooting light bulbs because I didn't trust the game's definition of pitch darkness. Gamey is putting it lightly, no pun intended. This is such a counterproductive way of pushing the shadow mechanics. It literally goes against one of the game's core tenets which is realism. Being at the whim of an omniscient entity that scans the map and delivers retroactive punishments nearly squanders that sense of realism. My third and final gripe with Splinter Cell is its linearity. Now let me be clear, I'm not against linear games. On the contrary, as my free time shrank with every year that I've added to the collection, I've grown to respect linear design. Good linear game design requires a great amount of curation, and for that to happen the devs must possess a keen sense of structure and pacing. Take how Bioshock 1 and 2 and the Metro series did things. Semi-open spaces with branching paths that looped back to the main path. I can't say that applies to Splinter Cell. Other than the odd moments when the game provides two or three options to access an area, crawl through the vent instead of the heavily patrolled brightly lit corridor, missions often boil down to moving from point A to point B. Even in the rare instances where players are provided with options, the game makes it so, so obvious through its design that there is an ideal path that players should seek out. Thing is, the school of linear game design Splinter Cell adheres to eventually spills over into nearly every facet of the gameplay. It fucks with the flow and pacing. To quote Greg Kesavin from GameSpot, Splinter Cell is sometimes reduced to frustrating bouts of trial and error. That line pretty much sums up my thoughts. It's a very safe scumming reliant game. The final objective of the CIA mission has Sam carry the body of the mole from the smoking area to the extraction zone. Naturally, the path is heavily guarded. To add insult to injury, Sam is utterly useless when dragging bodies. He can't shoot weapons, use gadgets, or even open doors. So I was left with no option but to safe scum my way to finding some very specific blind spots outside the enemy's line of sight and slowly advance to the rendezvous. It was horrible. It's also worth mentioning that if you play Splinter Cell once, there's really no reason to return to it, as you always play levels and objectives in the same sequence. There's no plot or mechanical reactivity of any sort. Which is a real shame because most of the levels lend themselves to the kind of semi-open level design Splinter Cell lacks. Like, what if you could've faked a bomb threat at the CIA HQ to clear out early sections of the building, with the caveat that the returning employees would be more vigilant later in the mission, making sneaking harder. I don't know, that's just one example. Look, I am aware of the fact that a new IP is a significant financial risk, even for a company with Ubisoft's resources. I can also understand scaling back features to prevent sinking money into a product that offers no guarantee that it will turn a profit. I get it, it's, it's a business. Still, I feel Ubisoft could've done more to spice up the gameplay. They could've doubled down on the underutilized platforming mechanics, or open up the level design by offering, let's say, two solutions for every other objective. I wrote this section knowing full well that it could become obsolete the second this video drops on YouTube. According to my research, the remaining two entries of the original trilogy address most of the issues I've raised in the script and bring lots of quality of life improvements. But as I said earlier, I try to judge the games I review on their own merits. So yeah, if you want to try this game out, keep what I said in this section in mind. Also there's a remake in the works, but I'm not getting my hopes up about that one. Even though I tore this game a new one, I still recommend you try Splinter Cell out. It's flawed, rough around the edges. I'd even go so far as to say that it needed another 6 months in the oven, as some mechanics seem... <laughs> 
underbaked. But look beyond these problems and you'll find a tense, very atmospheric stealth game with a decent espionage plot and some great instances of world building. And this is just the beginning of our adventure in the world of Splinter Cell. Thanks for watching. As always, special thanks to my wonderful patrons whose generosity makes these videos possible. I'll see you next time.